Mahabharat Part 1 Chapter 14 The Burning of the Gandava Forest The Yadus bestowed vast amounts of wealth upon Arjuna and he left Dwaraka accompanied by a long train of chariots and elephants as well as hundreds of thousands of cows all decorated with silk and gold. Subhadra rode with Arjuna on a fine golden chariot drawn by tall white horses. They soon arrived at Indraprastha and Arjuna went straight to his brother Yudhishthir. Arjuna clasped his elder brother's feet and then worshipped Yudhishthir according to Vedic injunctions. Arjuna then worshipped Daunya and the other rishis in the royal court. And when the ceremonies were complete, his other brothers embraced him with tears in their eyes, asking Arjuna to relate to them all of his adventures while he was gone for one whole year. After spending time with his brothers, Arjuna then went to see Draupadi. As he entered her chamber, she turned away from him and said, Oh, Arjuna, what brings you here at this time? Why, you should go and be with your new bride, for that daughter of the Sattvata race must be missing you by now. Draupadi was clearly annoyed. Arjuna was her favorite among all the Pandavas, and she feared Arjuna might come to prefer Subhadra instead of her. Arjuna repeatedly begged Draupadi to forgive him, assuring Draupadi that his love for her was in no way diminished. However, Draupadi continued sulking. A second tie always relaxes the first one, no matter how strong it may have been. Arjuna tried to console the beautiful Draupadi, but she remained silent, always looking away from him. Seeing that he could not win her over, Arjuna left her chamber and then went to Subhadra. He then asked Subhadra to dress herself as a cowherder girl. Arjuna wanted to remind Draupadi that Subhadra was the sister of Krishna who was Draupadi's beloved lord. Krishna himself had begun his life as a cowherder boy in the small village of Vrindavan. So by having Subhadra appear as a cowherder girl, Arjuna hoped that Draupadi's natural affection for Krishna would be awakened and directed towards his sister Subhadra. The Yadu princess Subhadra was then brought into Draupadi's chamber, attired in simple red silk. The serpent girls who showed her in then said, This maiden has asked if she could become your servant. Immediately, Subhadra bowed before Draupadi and said, I am here to do your bidding. Draupadi had never seen Subhadra and did not realize who she was. But now, seeing her humble demeanor and being reminded of her lord Krishna by Subhadra's rustic dress, Draupadi's heart melted. She raised her hands and blessed Subhadra. May you become the wife of a hero and the mother of a hero, and may you be without any rival. Oh, Draupadi, May it be so. You should know I am Subhadra, Krishna's sister. Draupadi smiled and embraced her new co-wife. Her jealousy and anger were dissipated by Subhadra's gentleness. Draupadi asked Subhadra to tell her everything about Dwaraka and Krishna. They spoke together for hours. Then Draupadi took Subhadra by the hand and led her to meet Kunti. The two Pandava queens 
soon became close friends and would spend much time together discussing the activities of Krishna and his associates. After a few days, Krishna and Balaram came to Indraprastha, accompanied by his sons and ministers, and riding at the head of a great army, Krishna entered the Pandava city, where Krishna was greeted at the gates by the twins Nakula and Sahadev. And as they proceeded in state down the main highway, thousands of citizens stood along the roadside. They cheered and worshipped Krishna and his elder brother as they moved slowly towards the palace of Yudhishthir. The Yadus gazed around them at this marvelous city. The roads were immaculately swept and sprinkled with perfumed water. Fences draped with bright garlands ran down the sides of the wide avenues. On the tops of tall white mansions flew countless flags and standards. The sweet scent of burning aloe filled the air and the sound of musical instruments could be heard everywhere. Krishna and Balaram entered the Pandavas palace and went before Yudhisthira and his brothers. Yudhisthira worshipped Balaram with all due ceremony and then embraced Krishna with affection. Krishna offered his respects and worship to Yudhisthira and Bhima then Krishna took his seat in the assembly hall. Many important personalities from Dwaraka also took their places in the hall, including Akura, Uddhava, Satyaki, Prithavarma, Sarana, and Krishna's sons Prajumna, Samba, and Anirudha. Krishna then gave Arjuna all the bridal gifts for Subhadra that her relatives in Dwaraka had sent. Krishna gave heaps of gold bricks and precious gems to Yudhishthira. Krishna also presented the king with 1,000 chariots adorned with rows of golden bells, each of them yoked to four steeds driven by well-trained charioteers. On top of this, Krishna gave him 10,000 milk-bearing cows 1,000 moon-like white horses with golden harnesses and a thousand white mules with black manes which could run at the speed of the wind. On top of this, Balaram gave Arjuna as a wedding gift 1,000 elephants, each resembling a hill decked with golden ornaments and bells. Innumerable other items were then offered to the other Pandavas, being brought before them by Krishna's servants. Placed outside the hall, the wealth given by the Yadavas looked like a sea stretching in all directions. Yudhisthira graciously accepted the gifts and then arranged for all the Yadavas to be accommodated in his palace. They and the Pandavas passed many days together in great happiness, and when it came time for them to leave, the Pandavas in turn presented them with brilliant gems as gifts. With Balaram at their head, the Yadus headed back to Dwaraka, but Krishna decided to remain behind in order to spend some time alone with his dear friend Arjuna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. One day Arjuna suggested, O oh Krishna, these days now are very hot. So let us go for some time on the banks of the Yamuna, for we have constructed many fine pleasure houses there. Krishna agreed to his proposal, and they set off. Soon they arrived at a charming spot 
amid groves of tall trees. High white mansions stood along the river banks, looking like a city of the gods. Krishna and Arjuna entered one of the houses where they were served varieties of exquisitely flavored food and drinks. They lay down upon golden couches spread with silk covers. After relaxing for some time, they decided to go for a walk in the woods. The two heroes wandered along the river bank, discussing martial arts and past battles they had each fought. Having walked for some distance, they sat down upon an ivory bench that had been placed near the edge of a dense forest. As they continued talking, a brahmana suddenly emerged from the woods. They looked at him in surprise. He resembled an old sal tree with a complexion like molten gold. His beard and hair were bright yellow, and he shone like the morning sun. His two eyes were like lotus leaves, and his body was well formed and powerful. And as the brahmana approached them, blazing like fire, Krishna and Arjuna stood up, awaiting his order. Yes, I know you to be the foremost of all men. I myself am a voracious brahmana who eats very much. I have therefore approached you two in order to beg my food and to be gratified by you. Both Krishna and Arjuna folded their palms, asking the brahmana what kind of food he would like. Oh, I do not eat ordinary food. Know me to be Agni, the fire god. Give me food that is suitable for me. Please help me to devour this kind of a forest. Agni Dave indicated the jungle where they were standing. Although he had already made many attempts to consume the forest, his efforts had been repeatedly thwarted by Indra. This was because Indra's friend, the Naga Takshaka, lived in the forest. So whenever Agni blazed up and began to cover the forest, Indra would send torrents of rain to stop Agni. I know both of you to be expert in arms. By your prowess, you will be able to prevent Indra from stopping me. Thus, I shall be able to consume this great forest. O oh, heroes, this is the food I desire to get from you. Krishna and Arjuna looked at each other in surprise. They assured Agni that they would do everything in their power to help him. But they were curious as to why he wanted to consume this particular forest. Agni explained that the Kandava forest contained numerous varieties of medicinal herbs. He needed these herbs because Agni was suffering a malady due to having eaten excessive amounts of ki. For there had been a great sacrifice performed by a king named Swetaki, in which so much ghi was offered into the fire that Agni became ill. Brahma then told Agni that he could be cured if he ate the herbs in the Kandava forest. But when Agni failed in his attempts to consume the forest, Brahma informed Agni, Oh, you will be successful if you gain the assistance of Krishna and Arjuna. For in a previous incarnation, these two were in fact the ancient and infallible deities, Nara and Narayana. They have appeared on this earth in order to accomplish the purpose of the celestials. Therefore, you should ask for their help. So you see, Krishna and Arjuna, I now depend upon you. I must eat this forest. 
Brahma has also informed me that the living beings within this forest are sinful and should be destroyed. Therefore, do not harbor any doubts. This act is sanctioned by authority. O oh, fire god, I do indeed possess many celestial weapons, but I have no bow capable of bearing their power. So if I am to achieve the task which you have set, I will require an inexhaustible quiver of arrows and a chariot drawn by celestial steeds. If you can provide for all of this, then myself and Krishna will surely accomplish your desire. Agni then meditated upon Varunadeva, the god of the nether worlds, and the deity immediately appeared, saying, What shall I do for you? O oh, Varuna, I know that you keep many celestial weapons in the depths of the ocean. I therefore ask you to present Arjuna with that celestial bow known as Gandiva, as well as two inexhaustible quivers of arrows. I also ask that you bring forth a chariot belonging to Soma, the moon god. Immediately, Varuna caused all those things to appear at that spot. Arjuna looked with wonder at the Gandiva bow. It appeared like a rainbow embedded with celestial gems. As tall as a man, it was flawless. Arjuna took up the shining bow and forcefully twanged its string. A sound like the crash of thunder resounded throughout the whole forest, terrifying all the creatures. Holding the bow, the joyful Arjuna next approached the huge golden chariot. It was filled with varieties of celestial weapons as well as the two inexhaustible quivers Agni had requested. The chariot was yoked with golden harnesses to silvery steeds from the land of the Gandharvas. These horses were capable of going anywhere within all the three worlds and could move at the speed of the wind or even the mind. Above the chariot flew a banner bearing the image of Hanuman, Ram's great monkey servant. Hanuman seemed to be burning everything that fell within his gaze. Other flags flew on the chariot bearing images of fierce beasts. All the creatures roared terribly from this. Arjuna then circumambulated the chariot and then mounted it like a virtuous man, ascending to heaven. Arjuna put on the suit of celestial armor which lay there. And as Arjuna stood with the Gandiva bow in his hand, Arjuna resembled the sun shining from behind an evening cloud. Arjuna then drove the chariot around, smiling as he heard the loud rumble of its wheels. Varunadev also gave Krishna a club called Kaumodaki, which roared loudly when wheeled about and which could crush even Daityas and Dhanavas. Krishna then mounted Arjuna's chariot, saying that he would become the chariot driver. O Agni, O Fire God, myself and Krishna are now ready to satisfy your request. Armed now with the Gandiva bow and assisted by Krishna, I am able to withstand the entire host of gods united with the Asuras. <laughs> what then to speak of Indra? Therefore, blaze up as much as you like and surround this entire forest. Immediately, Agni expanded himself around the forest and began consuming it with his seven kinds of flames. Agni assumed the fearful appearance he assumes at the end of the millennium, which he uses to destroy everything. 
Krishna then began driving the chariot all around the forest. It moved with such speed that it appeared to be continuously present on every side of the forest. Whenever Arjuna saw a creature trying to escape from the conflagration, he immediately shot it down. Being slain in the presence of Krishna, all the creatures dying in that forest assumed spiritual forms and ascended to the highest regions of transcendence. The roar of the fire could be heard for miles around. Red, orange, and blue flames shot high into the sky. The lakes and ponds in the forest were boiled dry and rocks melted. No creature was able to escape from the blazing kind of a forest while their screams mixed with the crackling of the fire. It blazed up to such an extent that it caused fear even to the demigods who went in a body to Indra anxiously praying. O Lord of the Celestials, why does Agni burn all creatures below on earth? Has the time come for the destruction of the world? Indra looked himself to see what was happening down on earth. Feeling concern for his friend Takshaka, Indra set out at once to stop the fire. Indra sent down torrents of rain, which fell in columns as thick as tree trunks. But the rain was turned to steam by the heat of the fire even before it could reach the forest below. Indra then became angry and amassed huge clouds over the forest which doubled the volume of rain. With its flames and smoke rising up and with lightning and sheets of water falling from the sky, the forest became most terrifying. Arjuna noticed Indra's attempt to put out the fire and so Arjuna sent hundreds of thousands of arrows in a tight network all over the forest. That net of arrows acted as a vast umbrella, completely checking the falling rain. However, the Naga king Takshaka was not present in the Kandava, but both his wife and son were caught in the blaze. They flew swiftly upwards and were seen by Arjuna. Instantly he fired an arrow which severed the snake lady's head. Arjuna then trained another arrow upon Ashvasena, Takshaka's son. Seeing this, Indra raised a most violent wind around Arjuna, temporarily depriving him of his senses. Ashvasena then escaped disappearing into the sky. As he regained his senses, Arjuna became angry with Indra. He shouted out a challenge to Indra and covered the sky with his arrows. Indra also became angry with Arjuna, releasing his tremendous thunderbolt weapon. Without delay, Arjuna invoked the Vayavya weapon which dispersed the huge black clouds. That powerful wind weapon completely dispelled the energy of Indra's thunderbolts and lightning flashes. The sky then became clear and a gentle breeze began blowing. Agni blazed up even more, fanned by the breeze and being fed with the fat of dying bodies burning in the forest. Agni filled the sky with his roars. Then Indra summoned many of the celestials to fight with Arjuna. Hosts of powerful heavenly fighters appeared and began sending their weapons at both him and Krishna. Blazing iron balls, bullets, rocks, and countless arrows shot towards them. Arjuna countered all the missiles with his arrows and at the same time cut down his assailants who fell screaming into the fire. Arjuna was unconquerable 
as he stood on the battlefield releasing his deadly arrows while Krishna skillfully guided the chariot. Indra Dev then mounted his celestial elephant, Airavata, rushing down upon Arjuna and Krishna. He then shouted, These two must be killed! Indra raised his personal weapon, known as Bhadra, urging his elephant on. Seeing Indra advancing, the other principal gods followed him. Even Yamaraj took up his death-dealing club. Kuvera took up his mace. Varuna took up his noose. The commander of the celestial army, Skanda, raised his Shakti weapon, and Suryadev came with his brilliant dart. The other demigods charged behind Indra with their own weapons raised. The Vishvadevas, Sadyas, Rudras, Vasus, and Maruts all advanced in one body towards Arjuna and Krishna, who stood fearlessly below. But even though they exerted themselves with full force, the Celestials were unable to overpower Krishna and Arjuna. Struck by Arjuna's mystical arrows, the demigods were forced to retreat. Indra smiled. He was pleased with Arjuna who was, after all, his son. And Indra could also appreciate Krishna's position. Indra knew very well that no one could overcome Krishna or anyone supported by Krishna. Obviously, Krishna desired that Agni consume the forest and at the same time, Krishna was enhancing the fame and glory of his dear friend, Arjuna. However, desiring to test Arjuna's power even further, Indra sent down a thick shower of boulders. Arjuna quickly reduced the stones to dust with his swift arrows. Indra then tore off the peak of a massive mountain, hurling it at Arjuna. Being not disturbed in the least, Arjuna cut the flying mountain peak into a thousand pieces, which all rained down upon the forest below. Indra was gladdened by Arjuna's prowess. He ordered the Celestials to withdraw, and as he did so, an invisible voice could be heard in the sky. Oh, Indra! Your friend Takshaka is not at present in this forest. Neither will it be possible for you to defeat Arjuna and Krishna in battle. These two are Nara and Narayana, the immortal and invincible rishis. Why, they are worthy of even the worship of the demigods. So desist from this battle for the burning of the Gandava forest has been ordained by destiny. Having heard the voice, which they knew belonged to the universal creator, Lord Brahma, the demigods retired to their own abodes. For fifteen days, Agni continued to consume the forest along with its inhabitants. As the forest was being destroyed, Hordes of Rakshasas, Dhanavas, and Nagas rushed out in fear. Arjuna cut them down with volleys of arrows. No one could even look at Arjuna as he stood releasing his searing shafts. Gradually the forest was reduced to ashes and Agni was finally gratified. Now, there was a leader of the Asura race named Maya Dhanava, who had been dwelling in the Kandava forest. Having hid himself underground, Maya Dhanava now rushed out of the forest, trying to escape. Agni chased him 
and Krishna raised his Sudarshana disc ready to kill him. So the intelligent Mayadanava ran to Arjuna, falling at his feet. Oh, Arjuna, I seek your protection. Save me. I supplicate, I surrender myself before you. Arjuna then raised his hand and told him not to fear. Arjuna could not refuse to protect anyone who sought his shelter. Arjuna turned towards Krishna, asking him to spare the demon's life. Krishna lowered his Sudarshana chakra, and Agni also stood back. As the flames in the forest died down, Indra again appeared before Arjuna and Krishna. Agni then said, O Partha, O Keshava, you have achieved that which could not be achieved by any other celestial. So please ask from me any boon you may desire, for I am very much pleased with you. O oh, Indra, I request from you all of your celestial weapons. My dear son Arjuna, I will indeed give you my weapons, but not just yet. When Lord Shiva gives you his Pashupata weapon, then I will bring you to heaven and give you all the fire and wind weapons and that time will come in the near future. Most surprisingly, Krishna himself asked Indra that his friendship with Arjuna might last forever. Oh, Keshava, it shall be so. And I also wish to give you a boon. Just as I pervade this universe, so by my power, you will be able to go anywhere you desire within this universe. The celestials then return to the heavenly planets. And as Krishna and Arjuna made their way back to their mansion, Mayadanava approached them. He bowed at Arjuna's feet and said, O oh, son of Kunti, you have saved me from the angry Krishna and the hungry Agni. Tell me, what can I do for you in return? O oh, Dhanava, I cannot take anything from you for repayment. This is my firm principle. I act only out of duty. It was because of that I saved you and therefore you bear no obligation to me. Go now in peace. Mayadanava praised Arjuna's virtue, but he insisted upon doing something for Arjuna. I simply wish to please you, O Partha. You need not see it as any kind of repayment. However, Arjuna again said, that he could not accept anything from Mayadanava. However, I do not want to frustrate your wishes. So if you want to please me, then do something for Krishna. That will be more pleasing to me than anything else. Mayadanava then turned and looked expectantly at Krishna, who was softly smiling. After reflecting for a moment, Krishna said, Yes, I know that you are the architect of the celestial demons. So if you wish to please me, then build a splendid assembly hall for King Yudhishthir. The like of this hall should not be found anywhere within the three worlds. It should contain the features of celestial architecture and be impossible for anyone else to emulate. Mayadanava's skills were well known to Krishna. Mayadanava had constructed many wondrous edifices in the higher planets for the Daityas and Danavas. Mayadanava then assented to Krishna's request 
and accompanied Krishna and Arjuna back to Indraprastha, where he was introduced to Yudhisthira. Yudhisthira marveled as Arjuna narrated the story of how the Kandava forest was burnt. Yudhisthira received Mayadanava with all honor and discussed the hall with him. After much thought, Mayadanava drew up a design. He then began to consider where to find the necessary materials for constructing the celestial hall. Mayadanava told the Pandavas that he needed to go to the Himalayas, for there I have left a large quantity of rough diamonds and other precious stones of every kind of description, including those not to be found on this earth. So I shall now go and fetch them. Mayadanava explained that formerly he had been engaged by Vrishaparva, king of the Danavas, to construct a sacrificial altar for the Asuras. He had gathered all kinds of celestial materials which he had stored at the house of Vrishaparva, high up on the Mainaka mountain. And there was also a great club with which Vrishaparva had once withstood the demigods in battle. Mayadanava would bring that club, which was equal to 100,000 ordinary clubs, and then give it to Bhimasena. Mayadanava would also fetch from the depths of a lake on Mainaka Mountain the large celestial conchal known as Devadatta and give it to Arjuna. If Arjuna blew that conch on the battlefield, it would shatter his opponent's hearts. Once having gained permission from Yudhisthira, Mayadanava left quickly for the north. He found that all of his wealth was being guarded by Yakshas and Rakshasas, and so with their assistance, Mayadanava brought it back to Indraprastha. After presenting the club to Bhimasena, and the Kanchal to Arjuna, Mayadanava commenced working on the Celestial Hall. Namaste Nara Singhaya Praklada Klada Dayane Hiranya Kashipur Vakshaha Shilatanka Nakalaye Hito Nrsingha Parato Nrsingho Yato Yato Yami Tato Nrsingha Bahir Nursingo, Rudnai Nursingho Nursingham Adding Sharanang Prabhaye Tavakara Kamala Vare Nakam Ad Buddha Sringham Dalita Hiranyakashipo Shabadvita Narahadi Rupa Jaya Jagadisha Hare Jaya Jagadisha Hare Jaya Jagadisha Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.
time As a soul you cannot suffer Cannot fall sick or die You are peaceful Full of knowledge Always satisfied Still for you there is danger Coming in two ways Ignorance and illusion The soul loses her way She takes her body as herself And so she feels the pain Then she's trapped up in the body Like a bird in a cage Trapped like a bird in a cage Trapped like a bird in a cage We are trapped Trapped like a bird In a cage You're trapped, baby How you gonna get out? Deriving its nutrition From the food and drink Taken by the mother The fetus grows And remains In that abominable residence Of stools and urine Which is the breeding place of all kinds of worms Placed within the amnion And covered outside by the intestines The child lies on one side of the abdomen With its head turned towards the belly Its back and neck arc like a bow The child thus remains Trapped like a bird in a cage Trapped like a bird in a cage We are trapped, trapped like a bird in a cage You're trapped, baby How you gonna get out? Trapped like a bird In a cage Trapped like a bird In a cage We are trapped Trapped like a bird In a cage Shri Bhagavan Uvacha Karmana Daiva Netrena Jantur Deho Papattaye Striya Pravishta Udarang Pungso Reta Kanashrayaha The Supreme Personality of Godhead Lord Kapila said, Under the supervision of the Supreme Lord, and according to the result of one's work, the living entity, the eternal soul, is thus made to enter into the womb of a woman through the particle of male semen to assume a particular type of body. Nathamana Rishir Bita Sapta Vadri Kritanjali Stubita Tam Viklavaya Vacha Yena Udare Arpitaha For seven months the living entity remains in the frightful condition of the mother's womb, being bound by seven layers of material ingredients. And so, praying with folded hands, the living entity appeals to the Lord who has put one in this condition. Fallen into a pool of blood, stool, and urine within the abdomen of the mother, the living entity's very own body, scorched by the mother's gastric fire, is anxious to get out, counting the months, and thus prays, O oh my Lord, when shall I, a wretched soul, be released from this confinement? 